Ravings from the lucid fringe. Ravings from the lucid fringe. Musings from an unposterized life. Improvised on the front line of love and beauty. Welcome, I'm Semerick Yarrow. This week on Ravings from the Lucid Fringe, episode 16, Final Mexican Adventures. Soul food and soul footsteps. Amazonte to Mexico City. Generally, in Mexico, I walked. I walked a lot around town centres, getting to know the lay of the land. I walked in the mountains and around the temples. But my body needed other things too, other ways to feel alive. Many weeks of just observing, talking, drinking in the culture was enough to send me swirling without a project to keep going with, without something to give back, some other ways to connect and feel myself. My arrival at the Pacific coast was an opportunity for that, and it seemed that even without the swirling of synapse connections of a hypothetical mushroom journey, synchronicities were ready for me. Perhaps because the same swirling 1960s mushroom energy I wrote of previously created this place too. The surfers found the biggest waves further west along the coast at Puerto Escondido, but Zipilite was a great place to swim, do nothing, and see what arose. Tony, who'd settled here in the post-hippie boom 40 years ago, had been doing nothing for a very long time, and had some exciting stories to tell about surviving beach hut encounters with wild wasps and other venomous experiences, in an enthusiastic Spanish I could catch thanks to his theatrical retelling. But for me... There was music, and other kinds of necessary waves to catch. Within ten minutes of my arrival, I had a gig, jamming outside a new cafe that was opening on the sands, with a looping, energetic, dancing, guitarist, singer, saxophonist from California, and a local drummer who'd just pulled along his whole kit to keep pulsing out the rhythms we swung and dropped and floated and wailed into the pulsing night all to a receptive audience that kind of just arrived out of the evening breeze. And I had a freshly squeezed juice and later some equally refreshing ceviche. Ceviche is as much a part of the Mexican Pacific diet as it is of the Peruvian. The basics is lime juice dribbled in the moment onto diced raw fish to kind of cook it with some diced salad eaten with bits of taco. Just what I needed. Zipolite's main street was just getting going when I headed off for my bed. I had three nights here at the coast, three days enjoying sun and sand and just kicking off. It didn't quite turn out like that. I wandered through the leafy, sandy streets the next day to get a late breakfast at a cafe, where there were also a lot of affluent and international gay couples, another part of the laid-back tourist vibe I was temporarily encountering and I found a wonderful place opposite where I could enjoy a contact improvisation class, a sounds journey, an ecstatic dance class, a lounge in a jacuzzi, and, the following morning, a fantastic hatha yoga class with a very proper and engaging Shaivite Brahmin from Kolkata, all remarkably affordable. Contact improvisation in its modern format began in San Francisco, so not a million miles from here the facilitator a gentle, focused local woman, and I began to stretch into places my body hadn't moved in for a while, with the help of other bodies with whom I could find the physics of joints and muscles and weight and balance. This was wonderful, particularly as the ecstatic dance class was rather different to those I've participated in before. Essentially my take is it was a big tropical nightclub session in the open air, just without the booze which was exceedingly wonderful in its own way, but not the guided and facilitated process I'm more used to. It needed me to lead my own journey internally, even while connecting with others from time to time, and setting that up through the contact improvisation work earlier was really valuable. Stepping out of language really helped too. 
though there were a few moments where facilitators for the day invited brief sharing. I realised then that I was far from dropping in internally to where my life was at. The intensity of the continuous external stimuli of these weeks on my own needed a little time out, and my inner soul needed a little time to connect. I spent much of the next morning writing in English for a change, just to journal, set intentions, and breathe a little into my personal year. The next day I took the camioneta for a few pesos further west to Mozunte, where there was another beautiful beach to hang out at. Another Pueblo Magico, for what it's worth, somewhere identified basically as a cool spot by the National Tourism Board. One more beautiful contact improvisation class and jam later, I topped off my final night at the coast in spectacular fashion. Johnny, the Californian musician, had invited me to do a gig there with Colectivo Mazunte, a wonderful band led by locals, including a fantastic guitarist, marimba and bongo player, a lovely Italian drummer and a Slovakian bassist, so I added to the international vibe for the evening, playing cumbia, Mexican ska, salsa styles and a bunch of great numbers. All of this at another mezcaleria, with a lot of people enjoying the vibe. Afterwards I was gifted a particularly tasty shot of mezcal, this one from a large bottle, like at Oscar's in Capulalpam, but containing large dead scorpions at the bottom. Though I was barefoot for the hot and sweaty gig, the drummer told me he always wore shoes, after doing a gig in the area where the drum beats caused sleeping scorpions to crawl through the floorboards onto the stage. And apparently in the village that makes the scorpion mezcal, the stupidly macho party trick is to put a live scorpion on your hand and down the shot before knocking the scorpion off again. I'll pass, thanks. The night ramped up yet another octave because now I got my promised lift back to Zipolite. I climbed onto the back of Johnny's Vespa, my trombone in one hand, his sax over my shoulder, while he managed his amp between his legs and we managed his guitar between us, which probably helped keep our balance on the winding coastal road. We arrived down at the main street in time to join a late night jam session, with one of the most energetic drummers I've ever had the privilege of jamming over, and a full brass section, there was a trumpeter and another sax player, and pumped it out for the late night crowd. It was a moment with a lot of realisations for me around the power of live music, which I'd not really tuned into for too long. The joy, even the ecstasy in the movements and the faces of the people around us made me feel how valuable this whole task of music was in taking people beyond themselves and helping them access something juicier. High energy bands happen so much alongside other loosening substances, particularly lots of alcohol, and I've often felt this was a pity. But for this night I was really able to let go of judgment. I know on all three of these gigs that we made a real difference, that people will remember somewhere in their bones and their souls, and I felt great to have been able to be part of it. It wasn't the only part of the night. It was great to chat and connect with Johnny afterwards, to share experiences and stories of beautiful music and musicians and our different continents, and feel safe at this late hour when I had a short walk home in the dark, safe enough to include a loose game of chess in those early hours. I had been judging myself a lot for coming to the coast, yet in some ways these gigs were the most profound connections with the largest number of people that I made on my adventures. Even if I wasn't speaking so much Espanol, that could wait for the last legs of the journey. I danced again in Mexico City at Hueta Roma Verde on a Sunday morning with a DJ from San Francisco, a lovely local facilitator, and a beautiful dome full of mostly local participants, led into the movement with a little more process, a little more breathing, a little more of a call to consciousness, and a little more cacao in pretty Puebla-style ceramic vasitos. Under the biggest jaguar dragonfly-feathered alabrije god, all in the centre of an organic farm in the city. It was like everything was coming together for my final weekend. The dance floor, for me, is where the energies of life come to be stirred, shaken and blended. My couch-surfing host, David, 
had been involved with the dome's construction, and so the synchronicities continued to come in the big city. He also lived really close to Colegio Flor de Lis, a charming Waldorf school where I taught two classes in Spanish on South African geography, admired the Shetland pony and the sheep, and enjoyed connecting a little with distant colleagues. It felt like this was all part of preparing myself for my return to home schools and dance floors, at the same time as I was trying once more to get a handle on a new city. And what a city! Ciudad de México, or CDMX in current shorthand, is the original American city in so many ways, and still comfortably the biggest city in North America and the biggest Spanish-speaking city in the world. It was the biggest Spanish settlement, so has always been the colonial city ahead of all the other European foundations. It was built directly on top of the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan, so replaced the most powerful pre-Columbian site too. And just to the north of CDMX proper is the site of what's generally looked at as the oldest of all the great Mesoamerican cities and temple complexes, Teotihuacan. It's so old we have no idea who built it or what they called themselves. The name is in the Nahuatl language from the much later Aztecs, and means the place where men became gods. I'd seen plenty of ruins by the time I visited, and was wondering if I really needed to see yet another temple complex, but really not seeing Teotihuacan while in Mexico is a bit like not going to Giza on your Egypt trip. So I duly got the bus out and padded around in the relative cool of the morning. The landscape, at times, looked a little surreally like the Karoo, with acacia-like trees and prickly pears just with an enormous pyramid behind it, the Pyramid of the Sun that dominates the site and once had a temple building on its top. And here's the curious thing, right here, at the earliest historical point of monumental construction, is the biggest complete complex in the country. No doubt it's built on top of earlier temples, including a well. But the mathematical markers along the misnamed Way of the Dead, because there aren't any tombs there, leading up to the Pyramid of the Moon and its plaza, are marking something else. Probably aspects of the Milky Way, given the precision of the alignments, as at other sites like Monte Alban. At Teotihuacan, it's also easy to see the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, with its combinations of realistic feathered serpents and geometric abstract versions. Here, too, are murals and other designs, and in the archaeological record there was a whole district of the city full of traded items from the Zapotecs. So it kind of summed up what I already had a sense of, an extraordinary, precise site for grand ritual and urban living a model for future groups, and a symbol of this place's central position in continental culture, all of which I chewed over at last with my comida while waiting for the bus back to town. I'd seen, too, pretty much all the tourist-oriented crafts on offer, though there were elaborate beaded skulls that I was tempted by. Perhaps most interesting as a symbol of how much work is needed to keep these sites available for so many excited visitors were the workers up on the terraces, clearing the annual plants that keep trying to cover them up again. I wondered if it wouldn't be better at this point to simply find ways to allow these places to be used again for ceremony, for dance, for spiritual practices like I had just experienced, rather than continuing to try and pickle them for all time which surely was never the intention of the original builders. The Aztec city was very different to this. They're generally seen as this authoritarian, bloodthirsty and brutal late imperial bunch, up there with the Roman emperors for their disregard for life and willingness to engage in human sacrifice, but they also had a pretty phenomenal way of working with aquatic plants and trees. I didn't make it down to Xochimilco, the remaining portion of the lake on which Tenochtitlan was constructed, but I did see their temples next to the Zocolo, and note the lean in some of the central buildings I entered, since Mexico City is all built on soft ground. With David, I walked past one of the only remaining rivers that's still running and exposed. The water issue struck me once more as a bit of a Mexican time bomb. 
In Cape Town, we covered up our mountain streams too, for 19th century public health reasons, but in Mexico there was more water in the past, and now more subsidence on a regular basis. As such, it's a bit of a miracle that the metro functions as well as it does. Even the 1985 earthquake didn't stop it, though when I was there there were a number of stations closed for ongoing reconstruction and firming up. A slippage in the soil substructure had caused havoc a couple of years back. Like I said, generally I prefer walking to get my bearings in a new place. But in a city as big as Mexico, the metro is also a godsend and incredibly cheap. There's very much a social democratic approach to the subway. I had a regular interchange where I walked past an interesting museum of astronomy, one of several free underground educational pieces, including an old Aztec shrine. The only adverts were government-funded, including lots of signs against gender-based violence. Front compartments are designated for women and children only, and there were lots of police officers around actually being police officers, making sure rules like this were adhered to. Very stern looking, but very reasonable and approachable whenever I had questions. And I saw three police taking selfies at the Zocolo one day, which was rather cute. Up on the surface, there were buses articulated into three sections, and trams, and double-deckers, and a brilliant scheme I passed a couple of times, the cable car service. Like with other cities of Mexico's size, there are shanty towns on the outskirts, without proper road access and often on uneven ground. To provide the inhabitants with public transport anyway, a series of cable car routes have recently been built, the longest in the world, with stations along the way. The whole transport system seemed excellent, which is why the one set of adverts I did see in the metro were rather jarring and tone-deaf. These were adverts for British creativity and innovation. The London transport system was one of two proofs of this being shown off. Now, I'm a big fan of the London transport system too, but it did seem bizarre to be advertising it as a reason to visit and invest in Britain, literally to people using the Mexico system which I was so enjoying, as if Goodness, the advertising team hadn't actually visited Mexico to work out if this was going to resonate. The British creativity bit showed off Sherlock, and while I thought that particular little TV series was extremely well executed, again, if that's all Britain has to offer when up against the dazzling creativity I'd experienced to this point in Mexico, I'd have to give the report card could do better. Anyway, such thoughts occurred while waiting or sitting on the metro. But to start with, I hung out in David's part of town, the southwest. Mexico is, of course, built way up in the hills, and reminded me strongly of Johannesburg at times. Dry winters, steamy afternoon thunderstorm summers. And since it's more than twice the size of the urban conglomeration of Josie, the southwest quadrant, which is the wealthiest section, is probably about the same size as the northern suburban area of Joburg with some old properties of equivalent enormous size to the old parts of Houghton, lots of green areas and trees in the streets, though rather warmer in winter as Mexico is tropical. Not that the locals seemed to know that, as at dusk thousands of dog walkers take to the streets and the urban parks, and the dogs, including obviously lots of chihuahuas, were often wearing jackets for protection against the cold. Some nights I did feel the need to put on a long-sleeved shirt or long pants, it's true. However, the similarities to Josie also came to a fairly quick end while walking around, because Mexico City is a lot older. I would walk around a modern-looking corner and suddenly find myself in the cobbled streets and small, colourful houses, marking a suburb that had once been its own colonial town, before being swallowed up as the CDMX grew. And so, helped by some mighty personal in-breaths and out-breaths, and some warm connecting through body and music, I was ready and energised for my final leg in this epic adventure. Big apples in the CDMX. Exploring the big city. Coyoacan the place of coyotes, they have statues at a fountain, was buzzing on the Thursday evening we walked around. It was like revisiting Oaxaca, a good, manageable beginning in the big city. Another beautiful Baroque church, and nearby a little history, 
Frida's Blue House lit up in the night, a cultural history museum with another fantastic Tree of Life design outside, and Cortez's house, Boo Hiss, featuring sculptures of Diego and Frida in the courtyard. Hooray! The whole legendary story of Cortez and La Malinche, his interpreter, his mistress, the mother of their son Martin, the first Mexican mestizo, an abandoned woman when Cortez moved on, etc., is rather centred around this whole barrio, quite away from the historic centre of both the Spanish and Aztec cities. There were also plenty of big bookshops around. Once again, I was feeling a little overawed at how much reading of actual books many Mexicans apparently do. On another day, I came past the Biblioteca Mexicana, which rather cutely has lots of reference reading rooms containing the personal libraries of renowned Mexican writers. As a contrast, in Garibaldi Square there were old photos of dozens of famous Mexican lyricists and song composers, with their names and their most well-known compositions. Mexicans certainly know how to meaningfully celebrate and acknowledge their creative history. We also passed many upmarket educational buildings, and my host, David, explained that there are an outsized number of private high schools in the city. The public high schools that do exist are enormous, tertiary campus-style places and hugely competitive to get into. There aren't nearly enough of them, so Mexico City residents who don't get good enough grades going into high school and want to carry on with their schooling have to pay seemed like an interesting lacuna in a country that is often remarkably localist and socialist in its approach. At the same time, there are serious quantities of students around, getting on for half a million at UNAM, the biggest single old-style in-person university on the continent, and also the oldest. Big and old are frequent words when dealing with CDMX, you'll notice. Oh, and the large blocks between streets are called manzanas in Spanish, apples. So New York is just a big street block. Everything in Mexico City was at another scale, not surprisingly compared to the rest of the country, and indeed compared to most urban areas of the world, and I'm glad I already had climbed plenty of cultural steps elsewhere to be able to take at least some of it in. Take the enormous National Museum of Anthropology, for example. By now, I knew that anthropology makes probably more sense in Mexico than anywhere else. Ordinary people, as much as scholars, want to try and make sense of both current-day rituals and practices and their origins, both in pre-Columbian society and in the wonderfully messy syncretism of the last few centuries. Anthropology is about living, evolving history. The massive central square features a fountain, or artificial storm, pouring from an actual solid stone totem pole dedicated to the Aztec god of rain, and apparently when they moved it here in the middle of a drought season, there were brief but torrential downpours. And so the myths and magic of the past continue into the present. I enjoyed seeing the ancient Mayans again, who felt like old friends so many weeks after my Chiapas trips, including Pakal's elaborate jade death mask, then a mock-up of his whole funeral outfit, and then a mock-up of his whole flippin' sarcophagus thing with its supersized stone lid that caused all the fuss, and in the Mayan garden, reconstructed monuments, including the three decorated chambers I'd seen at Bonampak and it was good to get a sense of what I'd see at Teotihuacan, only in reconstructed full colour, and see what I was missing at Tula, which is seen as the centre of Toltec culture. I didn't get to Tula, and I guess the Toltecs remain rather mysterious. The word means artist in the Huatl, which I rather like, though archaeologists tend to show us rather how aggressive they were, perhaps as predecessors of the Aztecs. My own access to the Toltecs is the same as everyone else's. Don Miguel Ruiz's Four Agreements, that handy post-Castaneda Mexican New Age shamanic Bible that's been the basis of many a certificate program in practical shamanism. If you Google Toltec wisdom, you get Don Miguel. And if you ask Google where he got his info from, you get Toltec wisdom. So perhaps it's a bit like the Olmec's sex secrets whose existence I'd read of, plucked from the ether through dreams and secret communications. Excuse me while my left brain raises an eyebrow. My right brain would still love to know more, but it wasn't going to come in this particular museum visit. 
There were other exhibits on a range of cultures I hadn't encountered out there, including the desert cultures in the north that piqued my interest a little more for the future, ancient mud towns and cave complexes and things. I was worried before I hit Mexico that the whole Hispanic cultural melange would all be fading under the influence of the Big Mac, which certainly wasn't true in the south or in the city. We down here in South Africa are definitely more affected on that count. I'm told sometimes it's the internationals, especially the large number of wealthy U.S. immigrants to Mexico City, who take advantage of the cheap access to art exhibitions and concerts that the government encourages and provides. And there are definitely places where English is heard a lot, which is disturbingly similar to bits of the Spanish and Greek coastline. But Mexican culture is strong, so in the long run it's going to influence U.S. immigrants whether they like it or not. Perhaps there's a little more U.S. influence in the desert north, closer to the border. Images of downtown Monterey look as clean and skyscrapery swish as, I imagine, Houston might be. And that region is where Pancho Villa was once operating, the bandit-turned-revolutionary leader that is the average U.S. American's idea of a Mexican caricature. Mine is of a credentialed and bespectacled bookworm spending his nights at the salsa club, but perhaps that's the average user of the couch-surfing app. Still, I am now more interested in exploring that northern part of the country if I get to go back. The central exhibit of the downstairs section was, predictably enough, devoted to the Aztecs and given a massive room for it. What made them arrive in history so ferociously, so close to the time the imagined white gods from the east turned up and got all ferocious themselves? Who exactly is playing dice out there somewhere? Certainly the centrepiece is the huge stone disc thing that everyone thinks is the Mayan calendar, though there's plenty of them elsewhere. It's actually a rejected part of a zone to watch people fight, and its discovery led to the Templo Mayor in the centre of Mexico City being uncovered again in the 70s. More curious was Xochipilli, Aztec male god of flowers, dance and homosexuality, in a sculpture surrounded by images of hallucinogenic substances. It's suggested that the Aztecs actually inherited him from the Toltecs, those artists who ruled over a soft age of flowers and eroticism ruled by Xochipilli's female counterpart, Xochiquetzal. This seems somewhat plausible, especially since the macho Aztecs and Spanish exchanged playground-style insults with each other over who were the bigger homosexuals. The Toltecs became, therefore, even more mysterious. I headed upstairs to the rooms looking at current Mexican traditions, including lots of fun devils created for a carnival, ready to be burned, and some very freaky paintings and tapestries produced by shamans under the influence of... Uh, well, I'd lost track by now. The final extraordinary bits of current popular arts I saw weren't there, though. They were in the ex-convent of Carmen in the upmarket barrio of San Angel. Here were wild variations on that classic theme of the nativity. An extraordinary one featuring the Holy Family as skeletons made from icing sugar, Puebla-style pottery urns with the whole detailed scene sculpted in front, one miniature, just in wood, but with the most intense, delicate pieces. A version based on the back of a multicoloured hippie VW camper van. And a bunch of other media and modes you've never thought of, and neither had I. This was perhaps the cherry on the whole cake of my Mexican experience. Proof that traditional crafts, even when limited to a strict Catholic theme, were capable of wild originality. I felt better about missing the Christmas festival in Oaxaca, where the craftsmanship is limited to being made out of radishes, all because one year there was an excess of the root vegetable, and so someone came up with a plan, and in true Mexican style, everyone ran with it from then on. Carmelites who arrived in San Angel were a little late on the Mexican Catholic scene, but they still found a beautiful spot to create an enormous convent there. They were given their original name thanks to another sighting of the Virgin, this time on Mount Carmel in Israel during the Crusades, which included being gifted their signature scapula. 
that sounds painful, but is actually a funky little over-the-shoulder accessory worthy of Zocchipilli. They'd then been given an intellectual boost in the 16th century by Saint Teresa of Avila, who reformed the whole order. Sometimes confusingly called Carmen herself, though Carmen is actually Mary, if you're following. Wakey wakey! John of the Cross followed Teresa's ideas, and he's pretty well known as a spiritual teacher even beyond modern Christianity. And Sor Juana, the great Mexican nun, scholar, writer, musician I previously mentioned, quoted Teresa when anyone tried to tell her she should shut up and leave it all to the men. Anyway, the end result here was a great convent and garden and loads of Baroque stuff once more. I'd already spent the afternoon popping in on a 17th century merchant's house, featuring a massive altar made from ceramic Televera, and so was really relieved when it got to exhibitions on modern stuff. At some point, all that fantastic oil painting in the same style would drive me nuts. And I was already a little freaked by the other ghoulish exhibit in the ex-convent, mummies. Not ancient Mayan or Aztec ones or anything, but late 19th century ones in Catholic costumes, and famously nobody knows why they were all mummified, or at least nobody's telling. That Mexican death cult thing jumping up again in unexpected places. However, the other things of note in San Angel were the houses of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, built as modernist artworks in their own right by Juan O'Gorman, the painter, who even signed his name in one corner, and connected by a top-floor bridge. Diego's was bigger, principally because he was always working on massive murals, which weren't so much Frida's thing. Seeing her two Fridas in the Museum of Modern Art was intense and moving. Diego's work tended to be rather bolder and public. You could quite easily spend a day or two searching for all his work in the city, rather less looking for hers, as a lot of it's been bought by international galleries. I saw more Rivera murals when I finally tackled the Centro Historico another day. There were plenty of skyscrapers, but not overwhelmingly so. It's like the modern statements could be made, but didn't have to be forced. The 19th century buildings are already colossal, like Chapel Tepec Park and Castle. La Palacio de Bellas Artes is solidly, tastefully beautiful, though I was once again not there in time for the concert or theatre season. Outside it is a massive statue of Beethoven. Many of the folk I spoke with said that Mexico caught on to Romanticism and didn't let go, even while Europe moved on. I'm not sure that's entirely true. Romanticism is very much associated with individualism, and there's a lot more of a sense of the collective, to me, in what I've seen and heard about Mexico. But what is certainly true is that with the Romantics came a rediscovery of the fantastic, and clearly that never really went away in Latin America. Gabriel García Márquez is the most famous author of the region, and although he was definitively Colombian, he also lived in Mexico for a long time. One older woman in Oaxaca insisted to me that there was a Oaxacan woman writer who'd influenced Marquez's original development of magic realism, which is the Latino genre par excellence, and definitely my personal favourite form of novel. I can certainly see how Mexico would inspire, where there is magic and history and twists and turns around every unusual bend. The national flag in the centre of the city is the biggest I've ever seen, big enough to be worthy of the Zocalo, which of course is up there with Red Square as the world's largest city plaza. And after all the Baroque I'd seen, I kind of knew what to expect with the Sagrario and the Cathedral as further massive examples of church and state power symbols. But what really distinguishes the centre of the city from other parts of the country or other great capitals are those murals. Taking their cue from the Mexican ancients, post-revolutionary artists like Diego Rivera took on projects that were much more dynamic and exciting than the kind of Soviet poster boy stuff being done at the same time in Russia. And I'm rather a fan of Russian creativity in the 1920s, so this is saying something. Orozco's work led it off, and it carries on today, of course. Some breathtaking modern examples were in galleries, taking what I'd seen on walls to a fresh point of exaltation in many different ways. I probably have Russia on my mind because of a certain Leon Trotsky. The residual old-school leftist in me, 
I'm not quite sure where he is these days, but he knocks around from time to time, felt the need to pay homage to Trotsky's house before my last night in the city. It's in Coyoacan, close to Frida and Diego. Diego got him asylum. Frida was briefly his lover. The post-revolutionary Mexican government gave him a place to stay after Stalin had already killed pretty much everyone he loved. The bullet holes from his eventual assassination remain in the wall, but so do the rabbit hutches. Trotsky was an animal and nature lover. His garden is full of lovingly tended indigenous plants from the mountains. It remained in the possession of his surviving grandson who passed away last year. It was a Spanish Stalinist who finally did for Trotsky after the Republicans had already lost the Spanish Civil War and when the brief pact between Hitler and Stalin was in effect. Mexico's role in the revolutionary left was not something I knew a huge amount about before, but it had certainly been there, just south of the USA, as the CIA moved into full let's destabilize the Americas mode during the Cold War. Although by no means everyone in Mexico was leftist. Outside the Franciscan church in Cholula there was a nice sign from the 1950s thanking the congregation for rebuilding parts of the church so it could stand strong against communism. I left Trotsky's place and wandered through the nearby impressive government-funded national film archives and cinema. You can probably get that I did indeed stack up a lot of steps through different parts of the city. Some days I turned strange corners and found unexpected food, like in the one-street Chinatown. There I had something like a cross between dumplings and sweet Japanese mochi, far too doughy though they had been given fun Mexican colours. Better to stick to the ample Mexican street offerings. Often cheap and delicious tacos with mushrooms or spinach sauce or eggs or stuffed jalapenos or some other variety, leading to some good banter and much satisfaction. I also had more tamales. David had found the muñeco on three occasions on the day of Los Reyes, January the 6th, which is still when Hispanic kids get their presents from the three kings rather than Santa Claus. Except, of course, they all know about Santa Claus, so mostly they get presents two weeks earlier as well. <sighs> he revealed that this meant he needed to make loads of tamales in February for his friends. I, too, had eaten a small rosca de reyes, the traditional Spanish Catholic fruit cake, though after the date. As it was just me eating it, I, too, found the muñeco, that's the small white plastic doll of baby Jesus hidden inside, and as it happened, that was the day I first ate a tamale myself from a street stall. This one had spicy green pepper inside and was remarkably tasty for such a basic piece of street food. Tamales are basically a bit like a lump of polenta boiled up using the corn leaves as a pot, or sometimes plantain leaves instead for a different flavour, with whatever filling is chosen, and then unwrapped for eating. David's mother made some for my final breakfast with them, with cheese and with mushrooms. All were very delicious. With it, she had brewed up alote, a malty hot maize drink. Yet another variation on a theme, and quite a contrast to the cold maize and cacao trejates that I had drunk in Oaxaca, which are not to be confused with a local beer with a similar name. On my final night in Mexico City, I had my last nieve, a snow, that's a much cuter name for a sorbet, sometimes offered alongside helados, traditional ice creams, but often on their own and in much greater variety than usual given the enormous range of Mexican fruits. As I ate it, I wandered through some park areas. It was great to see how full they were in the still warmish but by now dark evening. People learning salsa dance or skating, couples meeting on benches, and women comfortably sitting alone too. I would be sad to leave this place, which gave me such food for the soul. But it was time to get back to the Cape summer, digest the many tastes and colours I'd experienced, and let it all sink into my dreams. So, thank you for listening to this latest episode in the series. And you can find all of my articles and my recordings at 
lucidfringe.substack.com except my music and poetry from the past which is all available at simrickyarrow or one word dot bandcamp dot com and the background recordings and sounds that you will have heard are all either from those recordings or they are my own please do give this a rating if it's on your podcast app please spread the word if you enjoy what you hear and if you want to give me some feedback or commentary of course i'm very open to that any suggestions for future episodes okay enjoy see you next time Ravings from the Lucid Fringe Ravings from the Lucid Fringe Musings from an unpasteurized life Improvised on the front line of love and beauty.